Um, hit the usual 16 different buttons here. Excellent. Well, nice to see all of your uh, upper parts of your faces here. Uh, welcome back to class. There's so many of you still here, which is which is just great. That's that's nice. I'm I'm glad to see that. Um, thanks, Alan. So uh, right. So let's see here. In terms of announcements, um, if you have taken your midterm, which I think is almost everybody in this room, then you should have received your grade uh, by now. That does not mean that you can discuss the answers. There are some students in this class who, thanks to whatever extenuating circumstances, are going to need a couple extra days. So you cannot post questions about the exam on Piazza publicly. Um, OK? OK. Uh, so if you have concerns about the exam, of course we're happy to uh, respond to them. Uh, let's see, in response to some questions I've already got on Piazza, if you submit a regrade request, I do not guarantee that we're going to get back to you uh, by the drop down line. I've also literally in my 10, 15 years of teaching encountered a case where a student's like regrade request had a substantial effect on whether they keep or drop a course. Um, so personally, I'm okay with that. Uh, other than that, the exam, uh, let's see. So your, your histogram of scores was posted on the, the Piazza. It actually was like kind of nicely Gaussian distributed about like 70, 75%, which is cool. That like never happens. <laughs> How's that? means nothing to you, but as an instructor, that made me very happy. Um, yeah, uh, any questions about midterm logistics? Not midterm contents, midterm logistics. Cool. Uh, as a reminder, I believe today is the drop deadline. I, of course, encourage you all not to drop. I think grades in this course tend to skew quite high. Um, for some reason, the students this semester seem to be quite risk averse, um, which is fine. I mean, you do you. Uh, but in general, I, I think most students in this class get A's and B's. I don't, I don't see any reason to give you a hard time. Um, but I get to scare you a little on an exam. That's, that's part of my job. All right, uh, so that's that. Um, but basically, your deliverables from here on out are things that move more slowly than that. So uh, other than this, you've got one more homework to go on shadows. We're going to cover everything you need for that homework uh, in today's lecture. Oh, good. Uh, the Europeans are here. And um, beyond that, uh, we're going to have kind of a grab bag of topics for the rest of 6837. As, as you've probably figured out, graphics is this funny discipline that's like 100 different disciplines kind of glued together. Um, and so like, so far, we've covered roughly the rendering pipeline. Um, after today's lecture, we're going to pull in some of these other topics that kind of are a little bit ancillary or like don't fit perfectly into that story. So like, we'll talk about colors and displays and hardware, some of that kind of stuff too. Um, so basically, your deliverables here are homework stuff, projects, and nano quizzes. Your next nano quiz is this coming Tuesday. Um, I think they used to be on Thursdays, but really the pattern is every other lecture, and we didn't have a lecture, so it's it's shifted. Oh, okay, then then it's going to continue being on Tuesdays. I don't know, whatever. Just look at the asterisks on the spreadsheet. I think you figured out the pattern. <sighs> okay. Any uh, any questions, concerns? No. Uh, fun. No. Yeah. So the way that uh, grading will work in this course, because again, my goal is to give you a high grade. Um, so what I usually do is the grade cutoff by default is at the 90% line for like, or like 10% intervals rather. Uh, and then we'll go back and discretionarily lower those scores, which is a good thing for you. Lower sounds scary, but that means that your grades get higher. Okay. Because again, I, I just want you to do well. I, Yes. There are, including one that I used to teach, and I got in a big argument with the other instructors. Yes? When will A4 grades be graded? When will who what? A4. A4. <laughs> yeah, so you'll certainly hear. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say something annoying. Um, yes, you will get a grade on assignment four, not to worry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, the, the goals that I've set for our TAs is to get the grade for one assignment out before the next one goes out, or whatever. You, you get the point. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Excellent. So it's my goal to grade your project proposals in the next day or two. You guys are welcome to yell at me as, as much as you want until I actually do that, because it turns out I have the attention span of a fish. OK. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started with today's lecture, uh, which is essentially the, the, the material that you need for your homework five. Um, 
as with many things in graphics, what you'll see is that this is one of these ideas that's sort of conceptually straightforward, and then you'll sit down at your desk and start to code it and realize it's actually a giant headache. Um, so have fun with that. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is talk about how to implement shadows within the uh, rendering pipeline. Okay, and what we're going to see is that, I mean, one thing you, you should notice already, like, we have an entire topic titled shadows um, in the rasterization part of our course, whereas adding shadows to your ray tracer was like, what, roughly three lines of code, right? Um, and so essentially, you know, by switching to this new rendering technique, what we're going to see is that to deal with even pretty simple rendering effects requires just a totally different approach and, and way of thinking about uh, rendering. This is also our sort of first serious discussion of a multi-pass rendering technique where we're going to need to like render different things into different buffers and then use those buffers to affect the way we render something else. Um, which is super cool. At least I, I remember when I was learning this stuff the first time, like it's somehow just a very different way of thinking and, and reasoning about these kinds of algorithms. And the more you think about it, the more you kind of realize all the cool effects that you can implement in this kind of, of, of setup. Okay, so there's your, your pep talk. So uh, we're going to cover two different strategies for shadows. There's the one that people actually do and then the one that we all teach. Um, so you'll be implementing uh, the first, thankfully. Um, or, yeah. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that, we'll, we'll talk about some strategies that like if you really want super detailed shadows in, in a video game, how you might go about it. Um, and I think those are a little bit more, more niche. So, th so the main technique that you should try to get out of today's lecture is called shadow mapping. Uh, and that's what you'll implement. But we'll also talk about a different technique called shadow volumes, which have this nice um, advantage of, of getting like nice sharp edges along your shadow, regardless of kind of where your camera is and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it comes at considerable computational cost. It's one of these scenarios where like, yeah, you can have a really beautiful shadow, but then like your video game AI is going to suck because you just like used up your whole rendering time. Um, so it's a, a pretty typical trade-off. So <laughs> for some reason, my materials on shadows start with um, stuff that every year I look at and I think, well, this is stupid. Why do I have these in these slides? But I feel like I have to talk about it anyway, which is why do we care about shadows? Um, you know, I think there's a pretty reasonable one, which is that we encounter shadows in our everyday life everywhere around us. Turns out that we're big walking devices that tend to block light and that affects uh, how light bounces off of things in a scene. So obviously if you're trying to render a scene in an accurate fashion, I don't think you need a whole lot of justification for why you, you, you might want to render a shadow. But that said, it actually is important to step back and think that shadows aren't just like an artistic effect, like, like getting materials slightly more physical or something like that can make your scenes look better, but I think perceptually often you're kind of okay with simpler uh, things that, than what you might actually see in real life. But shadows are really critical for your perception and your understanding of a 3D scene. And so rendering without shadows actually can create some pretty serious understanding issues, especially due to the fact that most of the displays that we interact with are not binocular, right? So a lot of the depth cues that your brain is used to using are, are no longer present, and we start to rely on things like shadows more to understand the, the scene around us, right? So, so some of the many reasons why we care about shadows include like giving us some idea of depth and ordering in a scene, um, giving you hints about lighting, where the light source is, and so on. Um, you know, obviously it adds realism to what you're rendering, um, and it also uh, can help you with contact. So for example, here's this kind of goofy uh, photograph. Um, so this is a nice uh, optical illusion which is what goes wrong um, when uh, your, your sort of brain's mental prior for how a shadow should behave disagrees uh, with reality. So here, um, believe it or not, this gentleman is not floating above the ground, but rather there's just like an oil stain, you know, about a foot to his left here. Um, but essentially what you can see is that just the presence of this slightly darker region is enough to really affect your perception of this, this scene. Um, and, and that's really the point here. Um, so shadows provide really important cues for depth um, and contact. Here's another nice example where essentially what I'm showing you is an identical grid on the top and the bottom and an identical set of just four uh, spheres. The only thing that I've changed is the shadows. And, and notice that your perception of the 3D structure of this scene has completely changed, I think, for most of us. right? So on the top here, obviously, it looks like the uh, balls are sitting on top of this two-dimensional plane. On the bottom, just by adding these little disk shapes, suddenly it looks like these balls are floating. And these, again, these cues are really important because you guys are all looking at a projector screen. There's no, there's no like binocular depth going on here. And, and so these are, are really important cues to get right. And in fact, of course, we've known that for much longer than we've known about uh, rendering. 
you know, early, arguably the uh, earliest rendering technology used shadows uh, both for depth cues and also to actually enact uh, paintings. So apparently, you know, if you're if you're trying, if you're not a very good artist and you can't look at your friend and then paint on your canvas on the side, you can maybe use the uh, you know candlelight and and shadows to help you actually trace out uh, the geometry on your scene. Um, sitting in the lap of the person you're painting is definitely optional. So uh, in any event, essentially, as a quick reminder, I mean, why do we, why am I going to all this work to tell you that shadows are important? Well, in some sense, it's because, again, it's going to be computationally expensive to add these to a scene. And so now, as you're an engineer, you know, you're coming up with like all the different ways that you can make your rasterization tool better. And you've got to go to your boss and say, I want to justify this hundredth of a second <laughs> to calculate these shadows is actually a calculation that you're going to have to do. Because that hundredth of a second, blah, that hundredth of a second could be used for a lot of different things, right? It could be used for shading. It could be used for better geometry. Uh, and, and I think this is a very typical setup that shadows is one of the very first things that people implement in the, the rendering toolbox. Much sooner, by the way, than things like reflection. So um, as a quick reminder, of course, shadows and ray tracing were no big deal. Essentially, all we did was we sent a secondary ray uh, toward the light source. But why is this not particularly compatible with um, rasterization? Do you guys have any suggestion? Like, why, why can't I implement this strategy for shadowing? You all just took your midterm. Yeah, Alan. If, if for those who have not taken the midterm, there was not a question on this. Oh, you're right. Um. <laughs> the, I mean, like rasterization and acceleration doesn't really play well with like the recursion and like the the like secondary rays that you're creating here, right? Because like processors don't really play well with like the like nature of the computations that you're doing here, with the, like as opposed to the easily parallelizable uh, computation you're doing in rasterization. That's right. So first of all, yeah, so, so, so Alan's absolutely right that you're, you're making secondary arrays, and recursion is not a thing that's particularly compatible with our, our setup. There's actually even a simpler explanation here, which is that, remember, rasterization draws one triangle at a time. I load the triangle, I draw it, I throw it away. Of course, reality probably does like a thousand triangles at a time, but whatever. Well, think about what happens in our, our shadow algorithm in ray tracing, right? Well, what do I have to do? I send that secondary ray, and then I have to ask a question, which is, does that ray intersect any other triangle before it gets to the light? Is that a query that I can answer if I'm streaming one triangle at a time? No, because I haven't seen some of the triangles yet, and other ones I've already chewed up and spat back out. right? And so in order to do this kind of technique, I really need to keep the entire scene in memory, which is what we typically don't do uh, in, in the, the rasterization pipeline. Does that make sense? Excellent. So we need a completely different approach. <laughs> That's the basic point here. We no longer can rasterize by just sending that secondary array and checking if it intersects anything. Is that a question or just a? Yeah. <laughs> So I don't think we've actually discussed any algorithms for shadows. What was that? Hmm. So for, for ray tracing, it's exactly what you implemented in your homework, right? You, you intersect a ray with an object, and then you send a secondary ray and see if it hits anything. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about um, shadow mapping, where what we're going to do, uh, spoiler alert, is kind of render the scene from the perspective of the light bulb. I think I did kind of suggest that briefly in class, but we're going to go through a lot more detail today. Excellent. Any other uh, questions? OK. So today, in particular, we're going to talk about shadow mapping, um, which is, I think, the sort of dominant strategy for rendering shadows in the rasterization universe. Um, it's, again, mildly irritating to implement, but not impossible. It just requires like a lot of bookkeeping. Um, we're going to talk about a strategy called percentage closer filtering, which is basically a strategy for kind of anti-aliasing your shadow map. By the way, that's not a co complicated sentence that you guys can parse now. Isn't that cool? Um, and, uh, and, and we'll also talk about other uh, extensions, like cascaded shadow maps, which is also basically uh, an anti-aliasing kind of issue. The idea being that like, I don't need a high resolution image from the perspective of my light bulb. I need it from the perspective of the eyeball. And reconciling those two things is a little bit tricky. 
Uh, then we're going to more briefly describe a second strategy called shadow volume, um, which is used to get really realistic shadows in rasterization. I think this one, there are some cases where you want it, like maybe you have a really complicated scene and the shadow is part of the drama of it. Um, but if that's the case, then you're gonna have to expect to pay. <laughs> um, so we'll see how these are, are very different strategies. They also involve very different like buffers and usages of the graphics card memory, which is kind of fun to think about. Now, shadow maps, which is the main technique which we'll talk about today, have their history actually in movie production. Um, you might notice that one of the original uh, animated, uh, computer animated films that we all use as an example involves Luxo the Lamp, and of course that's no, you know, that's no coincidence. You know, Luxo the Lamp is literally a walking light bulb, so clearly uh, shadows were a pretty important part of the uh, drama of this little short film. Incidentally, have you guys all seen Luxo the Lamp, like the, the actual animated short, not just like the lamp walking up and hopping on the, the letter I, but like the full short? I feel like we should just stop and watch it. Maybe at the end of class if we have a moment so that I don't put it on YouTube because then your lecture will get pulled off the internet. Um, but yeah, uh, actually all the way back in Luxo Jr., um, they were rendering the scene from the perspective of the light and, and, and using these kinds of rasterization strategies uh, to make the, the shadows. Um, obviously in this case, they weren't concerned with real-time rendering, although my bet is that all the rendering that was used to make that old, or that old uh, short film could be real-time today. Um, but still, it was a reasonable approach to uh, drawing shadows. These days, of course, um, shadow maps largely appear in video games. Um, you know, outdoor environments are particularly important for, for these kinds of uh, effects. So in terms of how to think about the shadow mapping technique, essentially what we're going to find is that there's some duality. You know, this, this happens a lot. Like when we talked about ray tracing, Right, we wrote this one piece of code where we intersected array with an object and we originally did it just to like draw things and then we like noticed that it was useful like a hundred different ways. Somehow we're gonna do something very similar here. Like we already have a piece of code for rendering a scene from whatever camera angle I want and computing the Z buffer. And essentially what the shadow map is going to do is just reuse that piece of code in a clever way, right? And, and so in some senses it's kind of nice, right? It's that we don't need a whole new module for doing this stuff we're just kind of reusing the same calculation in a different way. So in this particular setting, what we're gonna end up doing is a lot of rendering that never shows up on the screen, right? Like we're gonna render the scene from the perspective of the light bulb, and the, some, like, the mild conceptual leak of faith here is that your rasterization tool is really putting stuff into memory. It's not like putting it directly onto your computer screen. So, so that's, that's okay to do, right? So here, we're gonna leverage a bit of a, a duality here, which is that like, there's some very close similarity between view computation and lighting, right? And, and that's illustrated on the slide here, which is uh, as follows. So, so let's say, just for simplicity for now, that, that my light is a, just a point light. So there's, I don't have to worry about the area of the light. Area lights are, are much more complicated in this scenario. And I wanna know what points get lit, right? So in other words, like at every 3D point in the universe here, I wanna know like, does it receive light from this light source or not? Well, how do I do that? Well, we already know from, from, from ray tracing what that looks like, right? I, I draw a line starting at the point where I'm curious if it should get lit or not back to the light. And if it intersects something else, then uh, it doesn't get lit. And if it doesn't intersect anything else, then it does, yeah? But here's a different way to think about it, which is, let's say that I took that light bulb and I just replaced it with an eyeball, right? So now I'm like standing at the position of the light bulb and I'm looking in the same direction. In this case, I've got a 360 degree eyeball, but whatever. <laughs> then what do we notice about what's visible from the eye and what should receive light? They're the same, right? It's exactly the same thing. That essentially a point is illuminated is exactly the same thing as saying that the point is visible from the light source, right? And that's a really clever trick. And remember that essentially we already figured out how to kind of determine what objects are visible from the camera, right? We made this structure called the Z buffer, whose job is precisely that, if you think about it. So essentially what we're gonna do is just reuse our Z buffer code to do this clever shadowing uh, kind of computation. And this is gonna be something that we can implement on the graphics card, but it's gonna kind of require multiple passes in the sense that like I'm first gonna have to render my scene from the perspective of the uh, the light source, then I'm gonna have to move my camera, put it you know, where I want to do the final render, 
and make use of that external information to do the shadowing. Does that make sense? Excellent. So, so that's our basic trick. So that's what the shadow mapping algorithm is. Again, it happens in two passes. The first thing that we're going to do is compute the depth map from the light source to all the points in the 3D scene. And then the z-buffer there is essentially the distance from the light source to its closest object. And then I'm going to render the scene from the perspective of the eyeball. Now, what test should I use? to figure out whether or not to light a point when I'm rasterizing things from perspective of the eye. It's a little bit tricky. So I'm going through rasterization. I've generated a fragment for an object. Remember, my fragment has a lot of information attached to it. right? It has a position on the screen, and it also has the depth of the fragment from the camera. Right? So in particular, I also know where the camera is. I, I know everything about the camera. One thing I can do is, given the fragment information and the depth, I can actually figure out in 3D where that point is. Yeah? Then what do I do? So I have a 3D position, which is the position of the fragment I just generated. <laughs> There's a lot of nods, but no, uh, <laughs> no help for me. Um, OK, well, let's think about it. So now. What I can do is take that 3D position, and I can apply the projection matrix of the light bulb, right? Like, the, like thinking of the light bulb like another camera. And essentially what that gives me, you know, I can compute now the depth of that 3D point to the light bulb, right? Now, should I light that fragment or not? Like, what test do I use then? So I now have, I generated a fragment for an object I'm going to render. I compute the distance of that fragment to the light source, and moreover, I know like what position in the, the, the shadow map it is. Yeah? Um, does it compare like, the z-buffer that you got originally to the one that you just, like the depth that you just got, and see if the z-buffer is um, less, less than the other value, because it is lost and doesn't actually get light? That is 100% right. Maria has exactly the right answer, which is that you know the distance of the object that receives the light to the light source. You know the distance of your fragment to the light source. If those two distances agree, then you should light it. So let's see if I can draw a picture of that. This is where I'm going to fail, because <laughs> your instructor is very bad at art. OK, so um, let's see. So here's our ground plane. Here's our light source. Um, here's an object. Let's see, I, I want to draw two things. One gets shadowed and one doesn't. Here's where I'm going to fail. Um, uh, like that. OK. <laughs> I think I managed. <laughs> so um, notice that, uh, so hopefully you can understand the scene I just drew. So there's like an object like this, an object like that, the ground, which is completely unnecessary, but I felt like drawing the ground, and the light source to the right. Yeah. So notice that there's like a shadow being cast, right? Like it goes kind of like that, right? So part of this thing receives light, and part of it does not. With me so far? In fact, just for convenience, I'm going to take this object and kind of curve it like that so that it's easier for me to draw. OK? So everything to the left of this little shadow region actually receives light. OK? So how, how am I going to essentially go about this? Well, remember that I now have kind of two virtual computer screens to work with, right? There's like the screen in front of my light source here. And there's a second screen that's like in front of my eyeball, like that. OK? So what am I going to do? As I rasterize points from the perspective of the viewer, right? And in fact, what I do is I produce points in 3D, right? I produce like the locations of every point on every triangle. Does that make sense? So for example, Maybe I, I rasterize uh, this point here, right? And I can reconstruct, I know where the camera is, I know its depth, and I know what pixel it's at. So I can actually get this 3D position as I rasterize. Yeah? Well, now this object has its own camera projection matrix, right? So what does that give me? Well, in effect, I can draw a line back up to the light source here, and I know which pixel in my depth map corresponds to that same location in 3D. Does that make sense? 
Are we with me? This is one of these algorithms that I think it's like easy to be on board with every step, and then you step back and you say like, wait, what? Um, okay, so right. So what do we have so far? We have a point in 3D. We have a corresponding point on the uh, the shadow map here. And remember, what does the shadow map tell me? It tells me the distance from the light source to the first thing that it ran into going through each of these pixels here. So in particular, what point at that pixel, like what depth is it going to give me? Well, it's going to give me the distance to this point. That makes sense? So what do I have? I have this distance here. I also have this distance, right? Because I now know this 3D point, and I know where the, uh, the light source is. I compare the two. If they're equal, then it receives light. If they're not equal, then it doesn't. Does that make sense? All right, now tell me everything wrong with this algorithm. What are all the bugs that are going to come up when you implement it? Yeah? I mean, saying equal doesn't really make sense. We have to like, keep them kind of equal. Compared. That's right. Notice that there's a lot of opportunity for round off in this algorithm. <laughs> Like, uh, let's see if we can name them all. So for one, every single time I do arithmetic here, I could round up and down. Moreover, I only really have the depth values at the points on this grid in my uh, texture map. And those are isolated locations, right? And chances are, when I project back, it won't end up at a perfect pixel place, right? So as, uh, as George suggests, we're going to have to do some, some careful like tolerances and rounding and all that kind of stuff to account for that. In fact, there's a really funny scenario called self-shadowing. Um, which can happen if you get this wrong, or maybe I render a scene. Here's an even simpler scene. So here's my light bulb. Here's my light source. Here's an object. So like there are no shadows at all, right? But here's the problem. So I compare these two depth values, and like maybe just because of rounding, like every once in a while one's bigger, and every once in a while the other one's bigger, and you just end up seeing like stripes or something, right? And so typically you need to build in a fudge factor, just like you did with your ray tracer and in many other places. So rounding is one issue, and then another issue is the resolution of the shadow map, right? Like you've got this grid here. Um, I see your hand there. I'll come back to you in a second. Um, notice that like some really skew weird things can happen, right? So think about like, let's say my eye again is pointing straight down. I've got this ground plane. I'll keep continuing it like that, and I actually I have a light source like way off to the side, right? So when I render the scene from the perspective of the light source. I have this nice even grid in front of the light source, like that. Well, what's going to happen? Well, if you think about it, like I'm going to be projecting all these rays onto the ground. And they get really far apart, right? So from the perspective of this guy's image, the resolution of this depth map by the time it gets like all the way out here is actually quite low, right? And so what you're going to see is like giant pixels sitting on the ground that correspond to individual shadow or not shadow decisions in the, the, the depth map here. All right, what's the question? Good, way ahead of you. Any other questions? Fabulous. So, so that's, that's it for the shadow mapping algorithm. You just have to keep track and remember that there's two different projection matrices that you have to cope with. So the basic steps are you generate a fragment here. You put back its 3D position there, and then you apply this guy's camera projection to figure out what pixel to read the depth value from. Everybody on board? Yeah, Ari. Right. Sorry, I might have missed. I'm so sorry. Like, no apologies. Um, you might have said like we're not going over this today, so I apologize. But yeah, um, are there issues with global illumination? Because this is just like one light source. Yeah, so there's no global illumination at all in this algorithm. This is all direct. Yeah, global illumination is quite hard to implement in rasterization, contrary to popular belief. Um, yeah? So if we have multiple light sources, um, like how do we handle this kind of like having it's like some brighter shadows and some less bright shadows? Mm. Yeah, so if you have multiple light sources, uh, well, think about what that means for your lighting calculation, right? So, so remember that essentially what you do Assuming that your light sources are not so strong that your, your surface is literally melting, you would probably just sum together the contribution from each source, which means that you would just do this calculation for each light, for each light source. Okay. What that means is that the expense of this algorithm scales. So the more lights that you have in your scene, the more expensive this technique gets, which is a problem. Yeah. Great question. Any, uh, any others? Excellent. 
Um, yeah, so here I think I filled in some numbers, but eh, it's basically the same. Um, yeah, the, the, the usual headache here is just the fact that like you need to deal with two different positions and two different image planes, right? There's the image plane of the, uh, the light source and the one of the camera. And so you're kind of projecting from one into the other. And that's the very typical source of, of bugs and headaches. Notice that you also have to kind of communicate to your shader both of those projection matrices, right? In OpenGL, by the way, you would call this a uniform variable because every single thread in your um, rasteriza rasterization code is going to need the same projection matrix for both cameras. That's called uniform. As opposed to in OpenGL, if you see varying, then like every fragment has a different piece of information. So that would be like the position of the fragment on the screen or something. OK. So there's some details we need to fill in in this technique. Um, one is that I've drawn for you a point light source. But notice that that actually doesn't really jive with the picture that I drew, where like you have an image plane sitting in front of your light source, right? Because like this looks more like a spotlight. So what do I what do I do about that? Any ideas? How could I like if I really wanted a point light source that can radiate light in any direction? Yeah, Daniel's experiencing a point light source right outside the window here. That's great. Um, any 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 ideas? How are we gonna how are we gonna use uh, implement point sources in our, our uh, shadow map? Yeah. Maybe like do multiple spotlights at like varying angles. That's a fabulous idea. Yeah. So in particular, I could put like a little cube around my light source, right? And essentially, now with uh, I, I've now kind of boxed my light source in. I now have six faces to this thing, and each one of those, um, you know, if I do it just right, it's going to you know, make sure that I can do shadow map in any direction. Notice that there's sort of two different ways to think about that. Either it's one point light source that can go everywhere, or it's really six spotlights <laughs> with different kind of frustum shaped, uh, 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 whatever you call that, penumbra or whatever. Um, the good news is that implementing a spotlight is as simple as not doing that, <laughs> right? Like just using one piece of this. Uh, uh, shadow map. Now, in terms of some of the aliasing issues that we talked about before, what could be a downside of using this kind of cube approach? Any idea? Yeah. Like at the edges, we might have like double lighting or like no lighting, even though we want would want it to transition uniformly between like. That's right. So, like, essentially, you're putting a cube around a basically a spherical object. So, like, the resolution of your shadow map is kind of weird, right? Like, depending on what angle the light is moving, like the pixels get bigger and smaller, which is a little strange. Um, I think like there are some other ways out here, right? Like you could use a nonlinear projection onto the shadow map if you wanted. I don't think that's too common. I think most people just kind of <laughs> don't worry about these artifacts a whole lot. But I, I don't know what what people do in uh, industry. Um, there's another kind of detail which is worth noting. Remember that uh, when we talked about rasterization, we didn't rasterize everything. We typically had like a view frustum, and we clipped when things got too close or too far away. Right? And there were a lot of good reasons for that. Right? Like essentially, this allows you to have higher resolution kind of depth values in the range that you care about is the sort of basic uh, argument there. Um, of course, that creates kind of a weird issue in your shadow map, which is that like, if objects are behind the clip plane of the uh, shadow map, suddenly they're not visible to the shadow map at all. Um, so you can get some really strange lighting artifacts if you're not careful where like, shadows actually exist in this finite volume. And then once you leave the volume, there are no shadows again. Um, so this is just one of these special cases you have to cope with in your code and, and make sure you get right. Any questions about that? These are just mostly implementation details, but they're things you might as well remember for your homework. OK, um, speaking of implementation details, there's one other one, which is that, unfortunately for us, people in computer graphics can never agree on conventions. And because of this, you end up in a bit of a headache. Um, this, I believe, does appear on your homework, which is uh, the following. So we, we talked a little bit about normalized device coordinates. Remember that? Where essentially we took the view frustum and we kind of remapped it to like minus one to one. Um, that's a very typical thing to do. Um, so uh, there's a bit of an issue. So we have to be a little careful like when we're using these two different projection matrices to index into our arrays correctly. Um, and in particular, uh, there can be a little bit of an issue because um, Essentially, when we place these uh, normalized uh, device coordinate, they tend to disagree with the texture lookup, which tends to be between 0 and 1 rather than minus 1 and 1. This is like one of these stupid details that doesn't matter until it does. 
Um, but just so you remember, um, <laughs> there's like two different conventions here, one of which is used for rasterization and one's for, for, for like looking up in your texture. Um, this does show up in your homework. It's just a thing that's worth noting. Uh, and it's a pretty common experience slash frustration in the graphics world. Um, of course, more typically, someday when you guys are the CEOs of your own video game companies, you can decree that everybody use the same coordinate system for everything and thus absolve your instructor from having to put this slide up and mumble every single year. OK, so uh, in terms of other uh, issues that can come up in shadow mapping, of course, something else that we already alluded to is that this, left hand, this, this less than sign in the pseudocode can be a little fishy, right? Because of like self-shadowing and rounding and so on. So the reality is that typically what we have to do is add a little bit of bias, like add a, some kind of an epsilon value here so that you don't accidentally shadow yourself. Um, and so, so that's a very typical scenario. Uh, and here's what it looks like if you get it right or wrong. Um, so here's a, a cube. So on the left is the cube with the proper shadows. I think we could all agree. Uh, and here I'm showing you um, the self-shadowing artifact. So notice that like this, this lit face of the cube has these funny stripes where essentially that inequality is being violated in little tiny bits. Um, so now notice that the shadow, by the way, is perfectly correct because the bias here is to like place shadow when there isn't any. On the other hand, if you add an epsilon to your code, now the lighting is correct, but we've like, if your epsilon's too big, you take a bite out of the actual shadow. <laughs> Does that make sense, like what's going on in these two images here? Incidentally, this, this uh, artifact has a lot of names. This is like one of these things that shows up all the time. Some people call it Z fighting. We, like the Z, the depth values are kind of fighting with each other. Another term which I don't love is surface acne, um, but these are all things that we see in practice. Okay, I feel like I experienced the latter in high school. So, uh, right, so um, like George uh, was gonna suggest until I rudely uh, cut in, um, one of the big issues with shadow mapping is aliasing. And the reason is that like typically, even if we get a really high quality shadow map image, it then gets projected onto some like ground plane which could be quite skewed to the thing that we just rendered. Notice this is sort of like the reverse issue of a lot of the aliasing we saw in texture mapping. Um, and so, like, what are some ways out? Well, the obvious one would be, like, make a better shadow map, like, just make it denser. But, of course, that's a lot of rasterization time, right? Like, that's essentially just saying make a bigger image, and, and that, that uses more of your compute. Um, and so, at the end of the day, a lot of times when you see, like, version zero of people's shadow mapping codes, the shadow map looks something like this where you see these funny artifacts, right? Now, these artifacts are not the resolution of the image that I'm rendering, right? Do you see that? Like, if you look at the, the corner here, you'll see that it's a much higher resolution image than these jagged artifacts would have you uh, think. These are actually, what you're seeing is the resolution of the shadow map, which is getting projected onto the ground, right? And that's not the same thing. So how would I fix that? Like, like what are our, our basic approaches to, to anti-aliasing? Interpolation. So that's an interesting thought. What do we think? Is interpolation a good idea? So I see a lot of nods, which is good because you walked into my trap. So let's, let's draw a picture and, and think about it for a minute. So let's say that I'm, I've got my usual, my favorite scene for today. So here's my ground plane. I never know why, like, why does everybody draw these little lines for a ground plane? Like, it's very clear. It's the thing on the bottom. I don't know. Okay, so um, I'm drawing a sphere. Speaking of lines everybody draws. And um, here's my shadow map. Okay? So what's going to go on in my shadow map? So like over here, this is 3D. See, it's, it's shiny because it's 3D. And then over here, we've got our shadow map. Okay, so in our shadow map, obviously, there's like some depth like that. And the inside of the sphere, this is like close. And this is like... Far. <laughs> so our suggestion was to interpolate depth values. What is that kind of doing? Well, if you think about it, it's kind of like inventing another object that's like here, <laughs> right? And so that turns out to create some kind of strange artifacts in the, the depth image, uh, or rather in the, the shadowed image. And so even though it, the inclination is to just use like bilinear filtering in the depth map, that actually can make the result worse. <laughs> 
Um, another way of thinking about that is at the end of the day, the decision that you're making about shadow versus not shadow is binary, right? Which is a little bit different from what we've done in like texture mapping where like interpolating colors really made sense. So instead, right, so, so, oh, right, so there, uh, yeah, so here's, here's the slide that says the same thing. Sorry, I get all excited and I anticipate the slide, so you might have noticed that I end up like hitting next, 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 next to the slides because we just already did it. Um, instead of doing that, what we do uh, typically to anti-alias shadow mapping is a little sneaky. Um, and this is a technique called percentage closer filtering. Um, and percentage closer filtering is one of these tricks that like, I don't know, I, somehow there's like this happy confluence that is gonna end up happening where it, you're gonna end up getting effects that look like soft shadows, but the reality is that they're completely non-physical and it's just a byproduct of this filtering technique. Um, which is kind of neat. <laughs> um, so, so here's what you do in percentage uh, closer filtering, which is rather than interpolating depth values, you're gonna do kind of anti-aliasing of the shadow test. So what do I mean by that? So like maybe I uh, have my pixel grid and you know, I'm gonna anti-alias my final rendered image anyway. So like I, I'm already like super sampling. Then one thing that I can do is like inside of my sub pixels, you know, each one of those subpixels gets a slightly different depth from the viewer, right? And a slightly different position on the, uh, the, the, the shadow map. So one thing I can do is anti-alias that. I can essentially do that shadow test at the subpixel level and then figure out like what fraction of the subpixels are being shadowed, still just using rounding in the shadow map rather than like uh, doing interpolation, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm basically doing my averaging kind of after doing that binary decision of shadow versus not as opposed to before. And that trick tends to actually work quite well. So here's what this looks like in practice. So here's percentage closer filtering. So here we're doing, I think, five by five kind of uh, samples here. And notice that you get this like very soft looking shadow, um, which if you think about it, like it really doesn't make sense if there's a point light source. <laughs> And, and the reason is that essentially what we're doing is kind of blurring things inside of the resolution of the shadow map. So this is like roughly the scale of one pixel in your shadow map. Uh, and, and you're anti-aliasing that test. So essentially what you end up with is this happy confluence of like typically we don't like hard shadows in visual content anyway. Uh, and so you kind of end up softening it. It's just in a way that doesn't actually have to do with your light source, um, <laughs> which is a little weird. So for instance, if you change the resolution of your shadow map, then like, the sharpness of this thing would, would change, which is not expected physically, right? Any question about that strategy? Essentially, the trick is to anti-alias the binary after the binary decision instead of before, which, if you think about it, makes some sense. So a second issue in aliasing and shadow maps can, can come up um, as, as kind of seen here. So here, we're like taking the shadow map um, texels. By the way, sometimes people say texel instead of pixel because it's like texture element and just like projecting them onto the ground plane, right? So this is kind of like taking the, those little square images, you know, like this, this terrible picture I drew up here. And notice what happens, which is that these signs, these, these sizes of these squares are, are quite nonlinear. In fact, if like my light source is pretty far away from the camera, then I'm in this really unfortunate scenario where like close to the viewer, I actually have really bad resolution in my texture map, or in, yeah, in my, my whatever, my shadow map. And so there are a lot of different people out there that think about different strategies for addressing this issue. Um, and, and this is a really tough one to get right. This is one of these things that requires a lot of engineering to really handle in a graceful fashion. Um, I think one of the typical things people do is just move the light source, you know, or like don't let you walk into a region where this kind of thing is gonna happen. Um, but we'll talk about one strategy for fixing that. Yeah, all right. That is a fabulous idea. So the suggestion was, can we do mip mapping but for shadows? And that leads to an algorithm called cascaded shadow map. So here, uh, it's, it's not quite mip mapping, but it is sort of multi-resolution would be the phrase that I would use. The idea here is that when we place that shadow map, we did so in a way that was not cognizant of the viewer, right? Like we just did it in some generic fixed location that was like close to the light bulb. But the reality is that we kind of know where in this image we're likely to need resolution. Does that make sense? Like in particular, you know, if I place that little grid 
here, you know, what do I know? Well, I know that my viewer can like see here and I can kind of roughly guess that like maybe this part of the shadow map is where I really need all the, the high frequency information because that's like where my viewer is, right? Like essentially I'm going to propagate some viewer information back into how I do the shadow map. Because notice I got to recompute the shadow map all the time anyway if my light source is moving or something. So what do I do? Well, maybe I actually make two shadow maps. I make like a super detailed one for just like a little small square sitting in front of my light source and then like a more, a less detailed one that covers a bit more space just in case the viewer moves further, like to cover the periphery of the scene. Does that make sense? So this is, uh, this is the idea of cascaded shadow maps. I think it's very typical of an engineering decision to have roughly like five. You might say, why five? And I would say, I don't know, because that's what the, the article I read told me. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any event, um, the basic trick here is just to cascade these things and to choose them in a very strategic way. And then essentially what you do is when you're doing your shadow map calculation, you now have like five camera projections to cope with. And you just figure out like sort of the most detailed texture map for which you have information, and that's the one that you use. That makes sense? So like here's a, you know, one uh, example of what this looks like. So here, this, there's a very complicated scene, and essentially what we're seeing here are like the different levels colored, right? Like the different parts of the scene, uh, in, in terms, you know, kind of getting information from different parts of this cascaded shadow map. Now, to, to continue with Ari's question, you know, Ari said a little, can we do mint mapping for shadow maps? And notice this is quite similar in the sense that like you've got a bunch of these different versions of basically the same information. And now like during your, your rendering calculation, you have to decide which one to use. Now, if we think back to mint mapping, like what can go wrong? I can get more artifacts when I mint map. Uh, for example, uh, in what regions does that tend to happen? Maria? when I'm switching from one scale to the other. So in this image, like where the colors meet, yeah? And indeed, that can be a problem here in cascaded shadow maps, right? I mean, like you have these like giant chunky pixels that we saw in our old shadow maps, and now those are gonna like reach funny uh, boundaries, um, and that can lead to a, like a visible transition between these maps. So what do I, how do you think I fix that? Well, the same way that I fix with, with mip mapping, right? Like I can blend multiple ones or something like that. There, there are some fixes here. Um, and so that can lead to um, some, some reasonable quality results. I, I think this is sort of, at least as of like five, 10 years ago, really the state of the art in terms of like what people tend to implement and practice for like reasonably good shadow maps that are not so hard to, to do in real time. Um, but of course, I mean, this is like, for instance, if I do five of these, I've just multiplied my render time by five for the, the shadowing part of my code. Um, so you have to be a bit careful. Um, any questions about that or about shadow maps in general? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a fabulous question. Um, and in fact, shadow maps are a really interesting case study there. Like, uh, if you think about animation, if your light never moves and you're just using the simple shadow map algorithm, do you need to recompute it every single frame? No, you, you just compute the shadow map once and leave it sitting somewhere in memory. But the second that your light source starts moving or you use some method like cascading shadow maps where you need to know where the viewer is, then like, yeah, you gotta do a bunch of recomputation each step and that, that can be a problem. Um, it's a problem for two reasons. I mean, one is that you now have incurred a bunch of math that you have to do. And the other, as you say, is it can add artifacts temporarily, right? Like, like now these, these transitions are moving and moreover, maybe like the resolution of your shadow map is, is suddenly adjusting itself. Um, yeah, these are absolutely problems. <laughs> How do people solve it? I, I, I actually don't know. I, I think, um, there's only so much you can do, especially in the virtual reality kind of video game setting where you don't know a priori where people are allowed to move, right? <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how much people really do predictively in, in practice. Yeah. Any other uh, questions I can, I can fudge on? Excellent. Okay, so that's shadow mapping. So essentially on your homework, that's what you're going to implement. Um, as you can see, conceptually, it's not too bad. <laughs> um, and in fact, on your homework, what we do to make your life a little bit easier is like, we'll show the final scene, like the final render. So you've got this like, 
I think it's like a temple with a little dragon in the inside or something. And essentially, you can move the, the camera. And moreover, there's like this spinning light source just to keep you on your toes. And then in the corner of the scene, we also show you the depth map from the light bulb's perspective so that you can kind of debug a little bit and make sure that everything makes sense. Um, and I think Zoe and, and some of your other TAs can tell you that debugging this thing leads to all kinds of hilarious and confusing artifacts, like you know, your light source moves this way and your shadow moves that way or something like that. It, it's easy to get this wrong. I get it wrong. That's why I don't, I don't have to do your homework. OK, um, so, so that's the, the actionable part of our lecture. Um, but it is worth noting that this is not the only technique for real-time shadows. There are actually many of them out there. And this is the thing that people do all the time. I mean, <laughs> for instance, like a, a very brain dead method for, for real-time shadows if like your light is stationary and your scene is boring is like literally to just paste your shadow as like a texture on an object, right? That, that would be actually OK in some context. Um, but there's another kind of dominant technique out there that we typically, they typically come in pairs. You typically teach uh, shadow maps and shadow volumes at roughly the same time. Um, if you want a good final project topic, shadow volumes are one that I've never, nobody in this class I think has ever done, but I don't know why. It's actually not too hard to implement. It's just kind of slow. Um, Maybe because we had to submit our proposals a week ago. <laughs> yeah, God, God, God forbid you hop onto Google for a minute. Um, right, so uh, yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about shadow volumes a little bit. Uh, and in particular, they involve. Um, yeah, uh, and, and they involve a particular object that we sometimes call the stencil buffer, um, which is a, basically just like any other buffer on your graphics card. It used to have a special name in OpenGL, but nowadays OpenGL is whatever you want it to be. Um, but there, it, it is a term that's worth knowing. Uh, and then we'll briefly talk about uh, deep shadow maps, which, believe it or not, is not a machine learning technique. Um, and, and we'll stop there. So uh, right. So shadow volumes kind of uses a different observation about shadows to derive a real-time shadowing technique. So like, remember, we built shadow maps on this observation that like, I am shadowed if I am visible, not visible from the light source. Right? That was the sort of basic piece of logic there. In shadow volumes, it's kind of a clever little construction where like, the shadow volume is like, let's say I have a primitive, like this square here then the shadow volume is literally a volume sitting underneath this square, which is all the stuff that gets shadowed by the square. Does that make sense? So like the shadow volume is like the volume of things that are shadowed. Notice this is sort of the opposite of how we thought about shadow maps, which are like all the things that are visible from the light source. Right now we're thinking about all the things that are blocked. OK? So essentially, what our goal is when we implement shadow volumes is to figure out when I render, uh, when I generate a fragment in my final scene, is it sitting in someone else's shadow volume or not? And that's what I'm going to use to uh, do my, uh, my rendering. OK, so this is a very different technique. We're going to like it because in terms of resolution, there's no longer a shadow map. Like there's no grid sitting in front of the light bulb that we have to worry about. And so you can get these extremely detailed shadows. The only problem is that like your shadow volume is like equal to the number of triangles in your scene, which is quite large, typically. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be uh, the basic headache here. OK, so, so here's uh, the, the, the world's most brain dead way of doing shadow volume. So, so let's say that I produce a fragment on a given triangle. right? Then one thing I could do would be basically, this is just a rebranding of ray tracing, right? like loop over all of the other objects and see if I'm in those objects' shadow volumes or not. And if I am in one of the shadow volumes, then of course I, I don't like that, that pixel. Right. So the complexity of this algorithm for a single fragment would look like the number of polygons times the number of lights. Again, this is just, this is just the ray tracing shadowing algorithm in, in different language. Does that make sense? Of course, the way that I could implement this could be a little bit different. For example, I could literally construct this volume, right, like this cube-shaped thing, and check whether my fragment were inside of that cube or not. And that happens to be equivalent to the, the shadow ray that we produce in ray tracing. right? And that's really what you do in shadow volumes. OK, so that's, um, that's the basic shadow volume technique. Obviously, this is really slow. If you're going to do this, you might as well ray trace. And, and that's actually faster than what I've given you here. Um, but shadow volumes have a much more clever implementation, which is, which is a lot of fun. I, I think this is a really sneaky trick. So, so here's what you do. So you can think of every shadow volume as itself like a little triangle mesh. Right? And in fact, it's an oriented triangle mesh. You know like what direction is out. Right? 
So let's say that I cast a ray from my eye to the fragment that I'm going to render. And as I do that, I'm going to keep track of a count, which is any time that I encounter a shadow volume um, face and it's facing my camera, so like the normal of the shadow volume is facing me, I'm going to increment a counter. And every time the normal of the shadow volume is facing away, I'm going to decrement. OK, so I draw a ray through my eye, and it, oh, it hits this face. Notice the face is facing me this time, so I increment. And then I get here, and I stop. Or I go to this green guy, and now what do I do? Well, I get a plus one here, and then I exit the shadow volume later. Oops, oh no, I used that word. I, I didn't mean to. I, I, I hit the back face, and notice the facing away, so I decrement. And so my total count by the time I get to that pixel is what? Zero. What do I notice? Do, which one of these do I shadow, and which one do I not? Yeah? Um, I guess, like, you could, when you're doing shadow, the one that you're doing not, uh, that the count is back not zero, because, like, you know it's within the prism, because you cast the ray as not passing through. That's exactly right. So the one that I shadow is the one that has a positive count by the time I generate that fragment. And the one that I don't shadow is the one that I, have a, I don't have a positive count for. Now, the algorithm, as I've described it, is still slow. I mean, I still have to do all these intersections. But this one has a hope. <laughs> so essentially, what, what's going to happen in shadow volumes is it's going to really cleverly compute that counter in a way that's actually pretty efficient, at least relative to what we've given you here. Relative to shadow maps, it's going to be kind of slow. <laughs> OK? Um, and in order to do that, we're going to use this object called the stencil buffer. This is one of these things that doesn't really need a, I don't know, somehow doesn't, doesn't really need a name. And I see you there. Um, but, but rather, it's basically just an, yet another little piece of memory where we're going to keep that, that counter, like something that tells you, you know, what things are lit and which ones are not. Yeah? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Anna asks, well, what happened if the camera starts in the shadow volume? Well, then all of your decision making has to flip backwards. Yeah, so we'll come back to that case in a minute. But that's, that's a fabulous question to ask. You're 100% right. OK. So here's going to be our uh, basic technique. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, so I think you have to work through a bunch of special cases here. Like you can imagine a universe where you're doubly shadowed. Like you have two objects like that. And you're sitting here, and the light source is there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of boundary cases you have to think through for this method. But for now, just think of yourself as being outside of a shadow. <laughs> okay. So here's what we're going to do. The stencil buffer is going to be initially set to zero. And this is going to be an example of a multi-pass rendering technique. Again, just about all these shadow methods are. OK? So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have to actually render the entire scene twice and do the, the, the shadow volume in between, <laughs> which is a little bit annoying. OK? So here's, here's what we're going to do. We're initially going to render our entire scene with like ambient lighting only. The ambient lighting only part, by the way, is like an unnecessary detail. You could do that at the end. What really matters is you're going to render the entire scene just to get the Z buffer. OK? Because now I know where I'll, notice that the Z buffer is not affected by shadows, right? That's just like the closest point that everything is to me, right? Well, why do I need the Z buffer? Well, now I'm going to take all the shadow polygons, right? Remember, that's all the faces of all those shapes. And I'm going to render them one at a time, OK? And as I render them, I know the Z value for each of the shadow polygons. Does that make sense? So what do I know? I know at every pixel, I know the distance of the object that I'm going to render to the viewer. And moreover, I know the distance of the shadow polygon. So it's either closer or it's farther. If it's closer, then I do that increment decrement thing. If it's farther, I just ignore it, right? Because that doesn't affect my count or not. Does that make sense? So that's step two of this algorithm. I'm, you could do it all front facing and back facing. That actually doesn't matter. You just as you render them, you need to remember which ones face toward or away at the camera, which is just a dot product. But essentially, for each shadow polygon, you just do this increment decrement thing, which is going to make use of the Z buffer. Right? Again, if I render the shadow polygon and its Z is farther than the Z buffer, I take no action. If it's closer, then I increment or decrement the, uh, the stencil buffer as needed. OK? So now, if you think about it, once I'm done with this, I now have a correct set of like entry exit counts at every pixel. And now I'm going to render the whole scene a second time. 
And now I have for every pixel whether I'm shadowed or not, right? Like in other words, whether that count is at zero. Does that make sense? This algorithm is really hard to think through. I, at least to me, I find it conceptually really irritating. <laughs> because like somehow it feels really dirty that you're like, you're somehow, you're, you're rendering your whole scene twice, right? You have to render it once for the Z buffer, and then you go through all the shadow volumes, and then a second time to actually do the, the shadow calculation or the lighting calculation. Okay, but the reason that you do that is that once you have that Z buffer, now you can do this increment decrement thing one polygon at a time, and it's all compatible with the rasterization. Like no longer are we doing like like um, ray tracing kind of stuff. That makes sense. Notice that this algorithm never requires a shadow map. There's no resolution whatsoever. This is all 100% like, this is the correct shadow, right? Like at, at every uh, fragment I've generated, I'm doing like the proper calculation. Yeah? Is it reasonable to do in real time? Is it reasonable to do in real time? So that's a great question. So we have to think about complexity here. So first of all, I've, I've multiplied the amount of time it takes for me to render by two at least, uh, roughly, because I have to do the Z buffer and then a second pass to, to render. And then moreover, I need to do all these shadows and notice that each of these shadow volumes, well, how many shadow volumes are there? There's roughly that equal to the number of the triangles in my scene, right? So this is kind of like just rendering the whole scene three times. In fact, the shadow volume probably has more like one, two, three, four, five faces on it, right? So it's like <laughs> five renders here, one there, one there. So you multiply your, your timing by like six-ish in the best of cases. Yeah, so this is quite slow. This is a big, this is a big factor, yeah. Moreover, as Anna points out, um, there's a big headache, which is what do you do when your eye is inside of the shadow? Um, this turns out to be really annoying to get right. There are a lot of different strategies people use. Um, some of them include like, just as you're iterating over all the shadow volumes, trying to figure out whether or not the eye is inside of a shadow volume or not. So that gives you like a baseline value to add or subtract to your, your counter. Um, a different thing that you can do is like actually just clip the shadow volumes in a way so that you're, this just doesn't happen. Um, or there's some other things too. So, so I'll let you guys Google that one. But it, 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 the, the question is, is insightful and exactly the right one you should ask, which is that this whole algorithm is really great so long as you're outside of the shadow scene. Once you're inside, it requires a lot of thinking and logic to get right. Um, there are some ways to make shadow mapping more efficient or ah, uh, shadow volumes more efficient. One of them is to realize that um, Oftentimes, you don't really need every single possible shadow volume. Like, notice there's like one giant polygon here, which is blocking a lot of stuff behind it. And so sometimes you can kind of very quickly clip some stuff out and, and realize that, like, maybe you can make some approximations or, or get rid of stuff before you rasterize. But not always. Any questions about the, the technique? I know I'm, I haven't covered every detail, and you're not going to implement this one on your homework, but it, it is a, an interesting kind of alternative because it doesn't. It's not subject to all the, the aliasing issues that, that typical shadow maps are. Um, right, so one thing that's worth noting is that shadow maps are a little bit passe. I don't think, uh, or shadow volumes rather. Um, it is possible to do them efficiently. I, I think Doom 3 was like, for whatever reason, very famous for this. Um, entertainingly, the graphics of this look kind of dated, but the shadow behind this dude looks great. Um, <laughs> and in, indeed, I think, uh, you know, some, sometimes, for example, you could use like some mix of different techniques, like maybe you use shadow volumes for like, you know, the, the really important character in the front and then, you know, something else for the characters in the back or something. As you can imagine, the, the, the engineering becomes very difficult uh, at that point. Um, if you want to see a great example of where shadow volumes are going to be just totally nuts, um, here's a good one. So here is a tree. <laughs> um, and of course, the reality is that you're doing a ton of overdraw here, right? Like you're spending a lot of time dealing with shadows that are like shadowed upon themselves many, many times that you don't really get to detect that in kind of, of, of this, this kind of pipeline, yeah? Um, this is particularly bad on tile-based uh, rendering where you then have to multiply this by the number of tiles on your screen, which is why I think it'll be a long time before your cell phone does that kind of thing. But who knows, ask me again in like five years, that might, that might change. Maybe, except, you know, I got this new phone recently, and it's like basically the same as like the last three iPhones. So I don't, I don't get it. Okay. Um, but the image quality is great. You can get really, really close up on the shadow, and, and of course, nothing, nothing goes wrong. This is a, sort of an arbitrary resolution technique. Any questions about that? Okay, so those are our two basic techniques for shadow mapping. There's a lot of um, 
reading out there, if you like this kind of thing, I think this is sort of everybody's first introduction to like wild and crazy hacks that people have in video game code. Like notice that like you wanted one rendering effect and to get it, you needed an entire lecture worth of thinking. So now go down all the lists of rendering effects that we talked about for ray tracing. And what you'll realize is every one of them has like probably some guy out there that's built a website about like their cool trick for how to do it. Um, and it's probably hard to implement and probably the only person that did. Um, in fact, there's an entire website, realtimeshadows.com, you can go to and read all kinds of clever uh, tricks and an entire textbook just on real-time shadows in video games. So you can, you, can, you can go nuts with this stuff. I thought for fun, um, we'd quickly mention a different technique called deep shadow maps. Um, this is not a technique for rendering um, shadows in real time, actually, but it's useful for participating media and things like clouds and smoke and these sorts of things. So here's a, a typical uh, issue. Um, is that oftentimes when I want to do rendering, um, it's in, in, in productions with like, you know, an explosion or a fire or whatever, um, shadowing becomes much more complicated than what we've discussed in this class, right? Because now essentially light attenuates as it moves through this material, right? It's not that it just turns off. And so there's actually like a little line integral that you have to compute to get the uh, shadowing uh, correct. And so, there's a whole other community in graphics. You'll notice there's this theme, right? Like for every small problem, there's like a million people that think about it. Um, that, that thinks about how you deal with these sorts of volumetric shadowing problems. And some of them are actually not terribly complicated extensions of what we've already done. Um, so in fact, shadow maps do appear in, in, in movie production and so on. Um, they can be a bit easier to work with than, than raycasting. Um, but the good news in movie production, of course, is that you can fall back on raycasting if something goes wrong. Um, but for handling scenes like this, you're still kind of in trouble, right? So here we've got some smokes, some smoke, some pipes. They've made a puff of smoke. And then on the ground, you do have a shadow, but of course it's attenuated differently depending on, on density. So that led to a technique out there called deep shadow maps. This was before deep learning was a thing. I believe it was in the 90s. And um, essentially the idea was to deal with smoke, um, actually, hair is another great example of uh, self-shadowing and volumetric shadows. It's really important for most people. Uh, and uh, essentially, the idea is that like, there's not just an occluding surface here, but actually attenuation along the light ray. Um, so these are techniques that can deal with shadowing, although there's no scattering uh, here. So like, I can't shine a light and then have the light bounce around inside of the, the, the smoke and end up somewhere else, which does also happen. right? Um, so the basic idea here is that essentially in a deep shadow map, you're going to have a bunch of shadow maps that you think of like kind of like a little stack of slides. And every time uh, in every layer of your, your deep shadow map, the number that you keep around is like the fraction of the light coming out of your light source that is occluded. <laughs> that makes sense? So like the farther I move into the smoke, um, you know, the, the, that number starts out at one and goes to zero. Of course, in principle, this is a continuous uh, function, um, but in reality, what we're going to do is just discretize it at like some fixed set of depths, and then essentially just like linear interpolate this thing. So essentially, the way the deep shadow map algorithm works is you have this dense visibility function at every pixel of your shadow map, and you can do that with like rays or rasterization, whatever your favorite technique is. And the way that you should think of it is at a given depth, what percentage of the light is left, right? And now, when you do your render time uh, shadow query, it actually is quite similar to what we've already done, right? Because now you have the depth of that surface point to the uh, light source. And what that gives you is the sort of right place in that stack to look up the, the percentage of light that's left. Does that make sense? So then you attenuate, uh, and you're, you're all good. So in deep shadow maps, they uh, use interpolation. Once again, I think they tell you to do it linearly. Of course, you could use splines if you wanted. Um, and uh, that's basically it. And the results are actually quite convincing. Um, so here's that uh, cloud with pipes. And notice that we have sort of the proper shadowing behavior here. Another example, which I think is one that is often neglected, is in hair. So hair shadowing is really annoying to get right. Basically, none of the algorithms that we talked about in detail today are likely to be useful or relevant for, for hair self-shadowing for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, the shadow, you know, like shadow volumes for your hair would just be an impossibility because there's way too many strands. Uh, and moreover, shadow maps would be too low, low resolution, so you're kind of out of luck, right? Um, so oftentimes people 
render shadowing in hair as they think of your hair more like a cloud of smoke, right? Like it's like a volumetric kind of thing. Um, and, and indeed, that, that's a really critical effect. So like on the left-hand side, we see the hair with self-shadowing. So like, of course, as you go on the inside, it looks a lot darker. On the right-hand side, we see without. Or here's uh, what I find to be a weirdly terrifying image, which is just a big ball of hair. Uh, <laughs> and indeed, it's a similar effect. And moreover, you can see it on, on the ground uh, as well. Incidentally, it turns out that deep shadow maps are useful not only for um, shadow uh, volumes from, from volumetric phenomena, but it's, if you think about it, it's quite similar to what's going on with like motion blur, where somehow like something is moving so fast, it's just occluding like a fraction of light rather than just a binary thing. Um, so exactly the same technique can get some of the stuff moved on the left. So to my knowledge, most of these techniques are not implemented in real-time rendering, although I guess it wouldn't be that hard as long as the smoke wasn't moving. Um, <laughs> there's only one problem with that sentence. Um, so I, it would be kind of a niche uh, setting where you do that in, in like OpenGL. In any event, in the slides we've included even more pointers. This is like one of these things that you could just do for like months. You can read all kinds of crazy shadowing algorithms. Graphics people love to get excited about this stuff. I have entire textbooks in my office you can come page through. So with that, you've got everything that you need for your homework. Again, your homework is going to involve doing shadow maps. To me, it's one of the more annoying calculations we do in this class. So if you haven't started, you should. Um, and yeah, so other than that, uh, congratulations on surviving your midterms. I look forward to reading your project proposals. And uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see you next time.